Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me welcome you in person <laughs> to these <laughs> seminars, as I did uh, by video feed. Um, this is the, the first session of our investment seminar where we're focusing on masterful investing, as, as you read in the course syllabus, with outstanding investors. We have two gentlemen, both uh, alums of this, uh, of this class that I consider to be outstanding investors and, and who do things in a way that I think represents my deep beliefs that I've been trying to teach these years. So I feel honored to have them with us this evening. I want to introduce both of them. Who's gonna, first speaker is going to be Mr. Bill, Bill Patterson. Bill uh, uh, was a, a Goldman Sachs alum before he came to the business school. He joined SPO Partners uh, with John Scully, whom you met uh, last week. Uh, a number of years ago and has become a name partner. Obviously, it wasn't called SPO before Bill joined it because there was no Patterson, no <laughs> P there at that time. So got his name on the building. They have done a wonderful job investing, as I said last time. And Bill has been uh, an exemplar, I think, of, of what it's like to be a corporate director as I served with him at Plum Creek for a number of years uh, as they were the largest shareholder in what is now our largest owner of private owner of land in the United States, Plum Creek Timber Company. And uh, uh, he has been an unfailing supporter of, of this course for uh, ever since he, he got out. Um, Bill, I want to welcome you back and thank you for being here for the first day. At my immediate right is Mr. Mike Shanahan, gentleman I've known since since college days. Uh, he joined. Uh, uh, he was served in the Navy after he got out of out of Stanford. Was a member of the Stanford golf team. Served in the U.S. Navy. Went to business school. Joined Capital as an analyst. And you might wonder, out of all of the you know, hundreds of people that have joined Capital, how anybody kind of rises to the top. And I think it was, without simplifying it too much, was being a great analyst and a great director of research. Um, moving from the mutual fund side over the trust company side, Capital Guardian Trust Company, which manages a big chunk of Stanford's endowment, running that well. But always being a portfolio manager and an analyst throughout this whole process. You, you never go to administration. It's very much like SPO in the, in the sense that uh, always hands-on investors that, that, are, that are doing everything. Mike, when uh, I think it'd be fair to say without getting too personal, when Mr. John Lovelace uh, retired, Mike became a, a ranking member of the capital organization. And, and so uh, that's based on his embodiment of the culture of capital, which he can talk to you about if he wishes, and his, the fact that he's a great investor, he's a great investor of other people's money. Mike still uh, runs uh, substantial amounts of mutual fund uh, money, and it's a pleasure for me to serve on the ICA board. ICA is the Investment Company of America, which is the flagship and the oldest mutual fund at Capital, which Mike has been a principal investor in for a long time. So we're going to lead uh, with, with Bill, then we'll move to Mike. We've been asked to hold the questions until both of them have spoken. We'll leave plenty of time at the end for live Q&A. So join me in welcoming back Bill and Mike. It's been 20 years since I was in your seats, and it's been, I think, 12 years here for me coming back to Jack's class. I always learn something, so I'm looking forward to your questions. I want to say before I get started, uh, George Markov here spent two great years at SPO. It's great to see another SPO alum in the seats. And I will say also it's uh, an honor and a rather daunting one to be sharing the stage here with, uh, with Mike Shanahan. So in thinking about how we'd allocate our airtime tonight, I briefly considered a cap-weighted uh, approach. And it, on that basis, I'm just about finished. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll turn you over to Mike. But I know Jack, Jack's hoping for a little more from me than that. I'll, I'll try in, in my time here to, uh, to offer some thoughts. I know John was here last week. He's probably told you a bit about SPO, how we invest. So I'll try not to go over old ground. I put together a, uh, a little handout, which I think I'll, I'll pass around now, Jack, and if you can send next door. Um, some of this will repeat what, uh, what John said, but I like to keep him honest, if nothing else, and uh, it's a good aid to my memory. So I don't intend to go through this in great detail. And I guess the first thing to say, and I was chatting with George earlier about his summer, and there are just so many ways to be successful as an investor. And I, I guess I'd be interested before we get started, just seeing how many of you worked in finance broadly before business school. So if you could raise, raise your hands, that'd be interesting to me. So, and how many on the buy side of investing? Okay. Well, that's a lot more than, than we're in my class, I can tell you that. But 
my own experience has been that uh, there's a lot of ways to be successful in investing. You'll hear about one from, from Mike. Um, as I've thought about it, I think the most important thing is having something that fits your strengths in a structure that aligns with the way you invest. And I'll spend a little time on that today because I think that really a lot of the success at SPO has come from being very disciplined about what we're trying to do and having a structure that reinforces it and a set of people that are really aligned toward that. So what is investing as we define it at SPO? It's trying to own eight to 12 really good businesses that we can have for five or 10 years in our portfolio. In that sense, we're not really competing with the likes of the capital group, which has a worldwide footprint of research and thousands of people working. And so our, our real uh, distinguishing features are going to be our ability to focus, our ability to share insights across a small group, pay attention to the things that could really move the needle, and make a couple of great decisions every, every year with our new, new portfolio positions. And that's really what I think of my, my job as being trying to define these understandable businesses that are misunderstood by others enough that there's a great value opportunity. And I've, I would say there are certainly periods when there's very little to do and there's periods when there's lots to do. And you can imagine today and this time is a time of the latter. There's, there's a tremendous amount to look at out there right now. And as a value investor, uh, it's one of the more interesting stretches I think that I'll see at least in the first 20 years of, of being at SPO. So since John's covered a bit on the, uh, on the firm itself, I think I'll stress just the public equity, private equity combination in our partnership. I think that makes us quite unique, really reinforces what we're trying to do, which is look at businesses and not think about them as stocks. Uh, over our 39 years, we've been able to compound our capital about 30% a year. I think this is working if we can keep it going. Um, but it really places an emphasis on making very few mistakes uh, so that we don't lose money and picking things that we can stay with for a long time because our idea generation model is set up to have one, two, and a really outstanding year three new ideas. So where do the ideas come from? Uh, I would guess two-thirds of them in our portfolio over, over the last 20 years anyway have been thematic. So if you think about investing uh, in our case, as we do, is the search for the needle in the haystack. We spend a lot of time trying to answer first, find a misunderstood situation, come up with a reason that could be a terrific investment. I pause on that because another way of thinking about it would be you're doing a research paper and you're doing research and out of this research is going to come some insight at the end that you will know what to do. So we're trying to invert that, trying to come up with what would be the answer, what would be the great investment and why would that be true? What would have to be true for that to be the case? And we spend a fair bit of time in our early efforts in these things bringing the dispositive negative perspective to that because if you're going to spend time on an investment, you've got to make sure you aren't going to later discover some fatal flaw. We have a small team, limited time. So it's this very interesting yin and yang of trying to force yourself to a thesis even before you know all the answers and then go about trying to really stress test that thesis. And it focuses, in our case, on things that are really undergoing deep change, regulatory change, technology change, industry structure change, the flows of capital changing in an industry, and then looking for what might that make true. And if that was true, what would be the purest expression of that? And I know John talked about Plum Creek and gave you an example of how that works. But that ability to look for the best expression in a public company, in a private company, in a company that you create with management to build if there isn't a pure expression that exists has been what we've, we've done and I think done reasonably well. It's a very bottoms up process ultimately. Once we get this idea percolating, it's going to be talking to companies, talking to um, consultants to those industries, looking at uh, the experience at SPO and like businesses over time and really trying to develop deep conviction. Because as I said earlier, this is one or two investments a year in a really outstanding year, and we're trying to put 500 million or a billion dollars into a single idea. So we're a small firm in the world of investment firms making uh, fairly large investments. 
And we sit, as George knows, around, uh, around one table. So typically, there'll be two or three people working on ideas, seven or eight people who are unassociated with the idea, objectively challenging, pushing, and, and, uh, and poking our idea for weaknesses. And I think this model of having that kind of interaction among peers in a small groups have been a big part of, of the success of, of weeding out ideas that have, have problems. And it's led to us probably saying no to a lot of things that would have worked out very well. So we make errors of omission. Uh, so far, relatively few errors of commission. The result of this process is that when we've made an investment, we typically end up being one of the top two or three shareholders, even in very large companies, because the pattern, as you know, of most institutional managers is diversify and have lots of holdings. And that puts us in another position to spend a lot of time on each investment and to mine those relationships for insight and I think ultimately to add some value through a dialogue that's based on knowing their business reasonably well. And that typically for us comes out of a, as I said, a bottoms up process that finds its way into a, a model, a model for the business. And whatever you guys do this, this term with Jack's project, I. I would get you thinking early about your the business unit model that you will eventually <coughs> use as the basis for your recommendation. It's a, I think a very healthy way to think about a business through the lens of how value is created, whether that's unit economics or how cash flow is generated by a business. And that is a big part of, of our process, I think, analytically, being able to fill in those key assumptions, think about what their effects are, and be able to look beyond the time horizon of Wall Street research, which is typically one year or two at most. <clears throat> on the second page here on the back of the sheet, I go through some of the things that we think about when we're doing that. It's a very uh, cash flow oriented view of the world, as I said. It starts with understanding the unit of the business, the transaction, and realizing that the business is an aggregation of all these small units or transactions. And thinking a lot about businesses that generate free cash flow, as we have over the years, it becomes very apparent that one of the most important things a business has is the ability to reinvest that capital at attractive rates uh, of return. So we're very focused in our own thinking. We think about value is what is the return on incremental capital that a company is going to be able to reinvest for us in the business that we own. Some businesses uh, throw off a lot of cash but have no great way to reinvest it, and those can be attractive. The twofer is when they're attractive themselves, undervalued, and then can keep making investments in their own business that exceed our return hurdles. And it's a very tax efficient way to create value. There are, um, I think across all of this, lots of challenges of implementation. The, uh, the actual template for this investing model being boiled down to a little over a page seems probably an oversimplification, but I think like a lot of things, the art and skill of this is in implementing this. And so there I think we get into a really interesting intersection of, of psychology and human behavior. And I, I thought about how I actually do this, and of course it's not pulling out this checklist on a regular basis, but I thought as I was preparing for this yesterday, what are the things that my disciplines, my systems, patterns, and modes of thinking that cut across this? And I, I think there's some mentioned, some not, but I'll, I'll, I came up with six. The first was just continue to remind ourselves that we're focusing on buying a business. So we're trying to think about that long-term earning stream in cash. To remember that very few things are certain. All these models we do are really just indicative of what might happen. It almost certainly won't be what we've modeled that does happen. But if we can think in terms of probabilities and expected values and these decision trees that you all get so immersed in in the first year, <coughs> I'd suggest that's a very useful way to think about most of the businesses that we invest. There are, there are propositions that have estimatable probabilities, and we shouldn't think in terms of certainty, but rather uh, uncertainty. And that gets back to um, something I'll touch on in a moment. Looking at compounding, the compounding of growth obviously is very interesting. The compounding of interest can be a problem. Uh, the compounding of probabilities can be a big problem. So when we're making investments, Rule number four on my list here is looking for simple propositions. Single line businesses where you need to be right about relatively few things. So we think about probability, think about having a 90% certainty about something. That sounds like a very high degree of certainty. If you 
you need to be right about five or six or seven things for this to be right compound 0.97 times and you're under 50%. So you see quickly how being right or very close to being certain about things may not be enough if you've got to be right about a number of things. So we've really tried to focus on pure expressions, single <coughs> line businesses, and simple propositions. I mentioned human nature and psychology. I think for us that boils down to both our, our own psychology, psychology of the market, <coughs> which are obviously very much in full display at the moment. We spend a lot of time at SPO on the contrary case. <coughs> I encourage you to do this too. Think about the thing that would most attack your thesis. And spend not too much time with, with management. We, we, we really highly value the management view. They're very important parts of the businesses. But what we found is really smart people who spend all their time thinking about their business and have a rational view of why they're going to succeed and, and we miss uh, the things and misunderstand the threats to their business. So not listening any too much to any one source, especially management, and focusing on the incentives people have to say the things that they do, I think has been helpful to me. I think it's the last thing when I think about implementing all this really gets back to probably the most important thing is, is selectivity and restraint that um, probably can cut across a lot of things in life. Um, but if you, only, you know, if you have a chance to just do a few things, and you think of what you're doing is trying to produce a few outcomes, you'll set a high bar for yourself. You won't say, I'll make up for it tomorrow. You're going to try to make good decisions. And if you can't make a good decision, you can do nothing. And uh, there's a lot of times in investing where there isn't anything compelling to do. And if you can set yourself up to be in a position where you don't have to do anything, you don't have to do the best deal that you could have done and leveraged credit derivatives in the last quarter of 2007 in order to keep your job, I think you're going to have a much better success, chance of success in the long run um, because you'll have set the bar very high for yourself. And whether that's your job search, your selection of a spouse, uh, whatever it is, I think in life that would be one of the things I would really encourage everyone to be thinking about in investing, uh, at least in the style we do, uh, a foremost advantage to, uh, to doing a few things. I've intentionally uh, compressed what I had to say tonight and do a little less than Jack had said, but I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to Mike. We're going to be here till the class ends, and I'm happy to go into depth on anything on this page or, or off the page if I, I can be useful. So Mike, I think I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mike.